Let us take our seats. We are tremendously blessed today. We're blessed today with the music and the choir and the prayers. And we're also going to receive three children by the act of baptism. And I would like to invite forth uh, Mickey Sanders and Michael Brooks, Jr. Bring your children. Isaac, give me a picture of this. Give me a picture of this, this family here. Amen. Stand right in front of the phone. Yeah, y'all good right there. They're good. Amen. And now also I would like to invite forth Daniel Jenkins bring forth her child. Danielle and her mother, get a picture. Now, as we gather here, I would like to uh, invite the family of, uh, the family of uh, Mickey and Michael uh, to come forth and stand around them. Amen. You've been upgraded, evidently, everybody. <laughs> Somebody upgraded them from the, from the phone camera to a real camera, amen. <laughs> and I would like to invite forth the family uh, to stand uh, with uh, Danielle Jenkins. Her mother is here and the rest of the family and friends, extended family. So I trust that the grandparents and godparents are here, is that right, of each of the children? And uh, I ask to hold that for a second today. And I invite the congregation, you can follow along with me in uh, the United Church of Christ hymnal beginning at page uh, 29. And we read these words, our Lord gave this commandment, you are to go and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Creator and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded. We receive these words from Matthew in belief that our children are included in the benefits and joy of this discipleship. As we read in Luke's Gospel, people even brought little children to him for him to touch them, but when the disciples saw this, they turned them away. But Jesus called the children to himself and said, Do not stop them, for it is such to these that the kingdom of God belongs. I tell you solemnly, anyone who does not welcome the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. In the sacrament of baptism, we celebrate the grace and forgiveness of God that we know in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here we proclaim that all life is God's gift and the gift is good. We thank, these, we thank God for these children that are in our midst today. We praise God for these children. We praise God for these families that are gathered here to support these children. Because one thing that we recognize is that nobody raises anybody individually. 
It, it, it takes all of us supplying vision and teaching and wisdom and love that allows children to grow up healthy and strong and wise, to surround them in a web of security and in a web of blessings. And so that is up to all of us as parents, as grandparents, as godparents, as the church, as the community, as those who are invested in making sure that this world is a decent and good place to raise these wonderful children. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask that we pause to ask this question. Do each of you desire to have your children baptized this day? All right. And I'm going to ask each of you standing around as family and godparents and grandparents, do you promise to be engaged constructively and positively in the upbringing of these children? That you would do everything in your power to protect them and make sure that they are raised in a secure and loving environment. Amen. Amen. Then let us join in a moment of prayer. We give you thanks, O oh God, for these children that have come into the midst of this community. We ask for your blessings to be upon them. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you guide and strengthen the parents and all of the family and community so that we can be positive agents and participants in these children's lives. Lord, we thank you for this gift, this wonderful gift called life. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have blessed us with. And we look with hope and we look with new vision upon all that these children will bring into our world. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the congregation, if you would join in the bold-faced print, to join in the reading of this covenant. Will you join, please stand and join in the reading of the covenant on page 30 of the United Church of Christ hymnal. We receive these children as new people in Christ. We offer our understanding and support as they explore life. We enfold these children in our love seeking together to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and all people. We join with these parents in telling the gospel in our midst so that these children may live with us for Christ, showing forth his love for all people. O oh Lord, giver of life and power, you've promised not only to be our God, but the God and Father of our children. Sanctify with your spirit these children that we will baptized today according to your word and bless this water that it may be a sign and seal of new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Start with you. Got it. By what name shall this child be called? Maya. Maya. Maya Patricia Burke. Maya Patricia Brooks, I baptize you in the name of the Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and pray that God's blessings will be upon you, not only this day, but for every day yet to come. <laughs> By what name shall this child be called? Langston Fisher Brooks. Langston Fisher Brooks. Langston Fisher Brooks. I baptize you in the name of the Creator and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and pray that God's blessings are not only upon you today but for every day yet to come. That's right. Give a hallelujah shout. Amen. <laughs> And who is this? <laughs> By what name shall he be called? Ari. Ari Liam. Liam. Jenkins Penn. Jenkins Penn. I baptize you in the name of the Creator and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and pray that God's blessings will not only be upon you this day, but every day yet to come. May you be blessed and filled.
All right, wants to know what's going on. <laughs> Why don't you give some glory to God for, for this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience and act? And we thank the Lord for these children and Michael and Mickey and Danielle. And as you go forth from here, we, we, we pray. We pray that the spirit of love and the spirit of joy and light will continue to surround these children and surround you as you continue to nurture them and give them great vision and cause with which to look, with, look into life with joy and, and wonderful anticipation. God bless you. Go in peace. Just some quick announcements. Uh, one is I want to just thank these choirs for being here and blessing us in a wonderful way today. We give thanks to God for the privilege of baptizing these children. Amen. And I want to just remind you that we have a prayer meeting call-in that goes on on Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. in the morning, 6 a.m. to 6.30, right? I mean, it's time you can get coffee or you get coffee afterwards, Amen. Or for those of you who are retired, you can wake up and turn back over and go to sleep after we finish. The call-in number and the code is in your bulletin. Uh, and, uh, and we uh, just invite you to participate in that prayer call-in. Uh, 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 we advise you to use a cell phone because that's a way in which you can avoid any toll costs, hopefully. I want to remind you of Thursday's 12 noon Bible study. Come and be blessed. And also the Health Ministry Women's Luncheon is after the 11 a.m. service in the lower hall uh, today. I uh, want to uh, just remind you of a faith town hall meeting on Tuesday at 7 p.m. at Michigan Park Christian Church uh, with, um, where Reverend Marvin Owens is the pastor. Uh, we have been pushing a piece that will require retailers, retailers uh, in in Washington, D.C., particularly retailers that are part of a national chain and therefore can afford it, to give predictable hours to their workforce and also guarantee more uh, hours to their workforce. That bill cleared um, the uh, committee and city council on Thursday, uh, and so uh, this town hall meeting is a part of trying to push that forth and get it implemented. And if you know anything and you work in the retail industry, you know you have the experience of somebody putting you on schedule at the last minute or you show up and they take you off schedule. Uh, and so this is requiring that those big chains give folks a predictable schedule so that people can plan their lives and plan their lives in terms of their families and other types of obligations. It's not too much to ask for. It's just sensible in this day and age. So we're continuing to push that, and we need your help to help push that. That's Tuesday, 7 p.m. at Michigan Park Christian Church, which is on the corner of uh, Taylor, and South Dakota Northeast. Let us prepare to bring our tithes, gifts, and offerings into God's house. Is somebody blessing us and leading us in that? Reverend Boyd. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. 
and the ministry here at Plymouth, we invite you to do so. So if our trustees would please come forward. And if you're with the parents and would like to write a check, please make your check out to Plymouth UCC. There's lots of duos and duos and duos in the
and this world may have gifts that you have given them, and we trust, God, that we will be able to nurture those gifts, bless that you, they you. may be able to bless you and be a blessing to this world. Yes. Bless all their Sunday school teachers and parents, their guardians, their teachers, and God bless these beautiful children. It's in the name of Jesus that we offer our peace and grace.
Amen. We give thanks for these choirs and musicians, and we give thanks for just the ability to be here and just to lift up our hearts in praise and in prayer. And I will not keep you long. Uh, I want to just lift up a few verses out of the uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, just two verses there, verses 13 and 14. It's a part of a larger context, but I'm going to just focus there. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It says, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. May God add a blessing to the reading of those words. Lord, we come to you in prayer now. We just ask that you just bless this moment of teaching, that you allow it all to be acceptable and pleasing in your sight and allow it to be a edifying and clarifying word. We pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. You know, most folks don't understand that when you read Galatians, in a sense you're reading Paul's last will and testament to the mother church in Jerusalem. When you read Galatians, Paul is engaged in splitting from the church in Jerusalem over some clear tensions that have been rising over the years. Uh, and part of that tension is, is the church still a Jewish movement or is the church more universal? The church in Jerusalem is saying that the church is particularly a Jewish movement and to be a part of it, you need to be Jewish. And, uh, but Paul was off in the Gentile world touching and blessing and baptizing folks who were Jews in the diaspora as well as Greeks who did not know anything about Judaism. He was calling them to the universal message of Jesus the Christ. And so you see in this text that there is this theme that continues to emerge here in Galatians of being free in Christ, freedom in Christ. Freedom from the empty rituals, uh, freedom from a certain order, and you know what happens in certain orders, uh, we draw a line around ourselves to include us, but that line also excludes the folk that we don't want inside. You know, we, we end up, we set up an order that includes some, but excludes everybody else, and, and those who are usually the ones in power are the ones who draw the line. Right? But, but clearly in this text, we are being reminded that there is freedom in Jesus Christ, that there is a freedom that comes about uh, in terms of our, our ritualistic ways in which we pray. There's a freedom that comes about in terms of how we may sing our songs, how we may give God uh, the praise and the glory. And there's also a freedom in the church is not only open to some, but the church is open to everyone. There is a freedom in Jesus Jesus Christ. Now, I know freedom is used today in our culture, and we hear it all over and over again on the news, and the word virtually has no meaning any longer, but it sounds good. There's freedom of the press that doesn't have the courage to investigate in an unbiased and objective way anything, but seems to be biased and, and trying to educate people either to the right or to the left and not present the story in its objective fashion. I get so sick and tired of hearing folks who are presenting to us the news and it's as slanted as can be, it is as xenophobic as can be, and often it is as racist as can be or sexist as can be, and it always excludes someone and it's presented as the truth. There is freedom of the speech. But without a form for that speech, there is no speech. Does a tree make a sound when it falls in the forest if there's no one around? There are people who went into unprovoked wars and the result was injury and death to scores of soldiers and the virtual destruction of countries 
with a long and, and glorious history in those countries, and it was done in the interest of protecting something called our freedoms. George W. Bush, after 9-11, declared that they, whoever they are, they hate us because of our freedoms. This is currently a word that comes now without meaning, but it works well in motivating people to justify wars, motivating people to subjugate other people, motivate people to oppress other people in order to protect our freedom. It is something that we are afraid and have a great fear out there of everything else that doesn't look like us, sound like us, or walk like us. We talk about freedom, and our idea of freedom in the United States, where we think that it is the ability to do what we want as long as it is within the law or skirts the edges of the law. My nephew, who just recently graduated from law school, we, we, we end up in this debate not too long ago over the mortgage meltdown. And, and I talked about the immorality of the mortgage meltdown and that people were being lent money on the premise that they would not be able to pay it back. So it was a deliberate ripoff. And with his lawyerly mind, he said to me, he says, yeah, but it was legal. And I said, it doesn't matter whether it's legal, right? The fact is, was it right? Was it, was it ethical? Was it, did, was it moral to do so? I don't care. Jim Crow was legal, y'all. But was it right? You know, the fact is, is that there is this idea that there is a, a sense of morality that we have to bring to anything. And so our idea of freedom, it does not mean that we can do anything that we want to do. That is what this text is trying to teach us, is that there is a limitation to our freedom. In other words, you are free because you're obligated to someone else. You're free because you have a relationship and a commitment to your community. You're free to have an engagement with somebody else that you can lift them up higher and higher. You're free enough to be able to reach back when you've advanced in life to bring somebody else along. You see, that's why this text says it, you're free, but not free to be self-indulgent. You're not free to be self-centered. You're not free to be selfish. You are free because God has given to you the gifts and blessings that God is able to give so that you can use the gifts that God has given to you to lift up and raise up humanity and bless humanity with your efforts. You see, Paul warns that freedom is not without obligation. It doesn't come without relationship. The desire to do the right thing in the sight of God and among humanity. We might be free in Christ, but because we are free in the teachings of Jesus, we are also limited in the things we do and what we do and how we do it. We are limited by our freedom. Now, I know that may sound like a contradiction. But that's a part of the problem in the United States of America, that everything in the United States of America is about me, myself, and I. All of this craziness that is going on right now in the political season is a narcissistic, self-indulgent, xenophobic type of behavior where folks don't believe they got a responsibility to anything else and they're trying to take the country back after eight years of a black man being in the White House. Let's tell it for what it is. It is this self-centered kind of mentality where somebody believes that they're better than somebody else. And therefore, they want to use their sense of superiority to put everybody else down. What in the world do you think went on in the United Kingdom but exactly what is going on right now in the United States of America? And I'm telling folks, you better wake up. You better not be asleep on election day. You better not be talking about all kinds of little esoteric stuff because I'm going to tell you right now, I am not going to step into the street because somebody walks past me on a sidewalk. And somebody said to me, they said, well, 
They're not going to pass a law like that. But don't you understand what's going on? Is that the, the, the forces of hatred are being emboldened. The forces of, 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 of xenophobia is being emboldened to, to, to really come and, 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 and apply a kind of destructive behavior to the rest of the world and the rest of society. I'm not going to go to sleep on that. I got to put on the whole armor of God so I'll be able to stand on that day. And when I can't do anything else, to stand anyway and to speak the truth to power. You see, we're not free to run away. We're not free to be engaged in our own self-indulgent will, but we're free to be related to somebody else. And the other thing that you realize in this text, what Paul was trying to get at, is that you've been given the gift of God's blessing. And when you're given a gift, it's not yours anyway. It didn't come from you. You didn't do anything to earn it. Right? You didn't even put your little credit card that's overextended up on a counter to get it. Right? It was freely given to you. That's what it means to, to be a gift. And God has given us blessings. And therefore, how dare we lose, use that blessings only for ourselves. That blessing is a blessing that God has given to you so that you might bless others through the blessings that God has given to you. To bless everybody without exception. Because if we end up engaged in this process of love, sharing the love of Jesus with each other, If everybody could get a little obsessive about sharing that love with somebody else, it wouldn't be this kind of world. There wouldn't be this kind of discord. There wouldn't be this kind of destruction. But sisters and brothers, we would be blessing each other with abandon because God has blessed us. I got to give it to you. I got to bless you because I'm blessed. And I, and I realize that, that I'm not blessed if you're not blessed. But if I got the blessing, then I got to pass on the blessing to you. And eventually our world gets filled with the blessing of God. And all sisters and brothers become free in the midst to live up to the blessings of God. I don't own it. I can't control it. It was given to me as a gift. And therefore, I'm going to pass that gift on. Pass it on. Because one thing that we all realize is that we're not free, and I'm talking about political freedom, until all of us are free. Let me say that. We're not free until all of us are free. That means LGBTQ folks, everybody, because I'm, sometimes we like to talk and make exceptions in our mind, but I want to be clear. Everybody, that we're not free unless everybody is free. God has blessed us with a determination to, to be in the world and speak about the love of Jesus and to do that with great faith and great forcefulness and to understand that the freedom in us is not manifest to there is freedom in the world for all God's creatures. Freedom in Christ. I heard somewhere where it says, when you're free in Christ, you're free indeed. You see, you see the, the idea of freedom here is an obligated freedom. It's a freedom of community. It's a freedom of sister and brotherhood. It's a freedom that recognizes, yes, it's the village that raises the children. It is a freedom where we come to understand our collective nature. Freedom enough, freedom enough, not to be self-indulgent, but to be universal and blessing of others because we have been loved. Now, Jesus... He didn't have to go to a cross. He could have kept it all to himself. Jesus didn't have to go through a mock trial. He could have kept it all to himself. He did not have to hang on a cross and bleed and die and suffer the inhumanity of going to the cross. He did not have to do that. He was God all by himself, but it wasn't about him. It was about everybody that he was shedding his love and blood for. And because that blood flowed from Calvary's hill and touched me and washed over me, I find out that I have an obligation to the one who died for me to dare to live for him and if necessary to even die in the cause of justice and in the cause of love and Christ. 
We are committed to stand together as sisters and brothers anointed, blessed, baptized, and lifted up by the love of Jesus. Oh, oh, there is a limitation to our freedom, and thank God for the limitation. I'm done, y'all. God bless you. Amen. Some folks in the choir got their mouth open because they were expecting me to go on a little bit, but I said it, and if somebody heard a word and want to give themselves to this liberated and liberating Jesus today, I invite you forward. Invite you forward as we join 404. Hold on to God's unchanging hands. If that's you, and you want to come and make a declaration of faith, we invite you forward. If you want to come and seek to join the church, we invite you forward. Everybody should have a church home somewhere. Everybody needs to be engaged in a community of prayer and a community of faith somewhere. So I invite you forth during the singing of this hymn. thanks for all that has been lifted up in song and celebration. We give thanks to God for each one of you and pray that God's blessings will be upon you, not only today, but let it be upon you this week and throughout your walk, that you feel God's blessings just lifting you higher and higher and opening up every door so that you can walk through victorious and successfully. Go forth and share some good news with somebody. And we pray this prayer in the name of the Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the people of God said, Amen, Amen, amen and amen. amen. Our closing recessional hymn, number 164. Amen.